Uh oh, what did you doing? <laughs> I was reading that article and it started playing a video. And now you can hear it. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> He's doing his research ahead of time, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hello and welcome to Money Lap. I'm Parker Klegerman, joined as always by Landing Castle. This is our podcast about all things motorsports. And of course, you can check out the Money Lap newsletter at themoneylap.com, which is growing insanely. We just went over 2,000 subscribers, and our open rate keeps going up, and the click through rate keeps going up, and people love it. So, pretty awesome. Uh, Landon, we're also recording this uh, in the morning on August 1st, tu- on a Tuesday, and both trying to wake up for this one because of our schedules. But you know what we have at our disposal? I have something very special. It, what is that? What, <laughs> for those who are listening, they can't see the video. <laughs> I am holding up a coffee mug filled with Four Sigmatic coffee in it. No way! Four Sigmatic Think Coffee? Yeah, that's right, Parker. And it's the coffee that makes you smarter. And how does it do that, Landon? It's confused with functional mushrooms that work to wake up your mind, which is what we need here on this podcast. They say many people feel the effects in as little as seven days. I even love their vanilla plant-based protein and their focus product. But you know what? For our listeners out there, if you want to try this coffee that you are listening to this podcast that is powered by this coffee today, uh, you can try their Think Starter Pack, which is 40% off, and then using the Money Lap code, it's another 15% off, which means 55% off to try the coffee that is powering Ooh. this very episode, foursigmatic.com, F-O-U-R, like four, sigmatic, S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C.com. Go buy some coffee. Let us know what you think, uh, and it really helps us on this show. So should we jump in the PR lap? <clears throat> yeah, let's go right to it. All right, so PR lap this is where we talk about ourselves. We're up to 92 reviews on Apple Podcasts. Uh, we're just eight away, eight away from our goal of a hundred. This is actually pretty fast that we've gotten there, uh, which is pretty cool. Do love that. And, uh, we had some nice reviews out there of which I don't have brought up here because producer Josh and I failed to put them on there. So anyway, there was three (laughs) new ones that were really nice. We'll, we'll shout them out later, but I just wanted to say, uh, thank you. And that we're eight away. So tell your friends, go review this. Uh, we're all five stars across the board, so we're at 92 and all five stars. We're doing a great job. And I had some fans – I'm going to talk about real-life reviews. I had some fans come up to me at Road America and over the last couple of weeks and be like, I love the money lap. So uh, we've got – I know they're, this is for real. They're not AI listeners uh, because they are talking to me in person as human beings. And it's, it's not your mom making multiple accounts and giving reviews from different accounts? Well, that I can't confirm or deny. So. <laughs> well, it didn't look like your mom dressed in disguise or anything like that to give you a real-life review? No, it didn't look like my mom. That's a good point. Thank you. Please good. continue giving us reviews, if nothing else, for Parker's uh, vanity. Yes, please, for our own vanity. Ongoing um, vanity of needing 100 <laughs> reviews. We need it. We need it. I'm, I'm joining Cameo if we get there. So we also uh, talk about our own racing in this section. I finished second at Road America this past weekend, my best finish. Led the race for about 100 feet from turn 13 <laughs> to 14. Was pretty excited about that. Um, and, you know, pretty much a, a big comeback day and a day there was no real strategy. We went from 17th to fighting for the win on the last lap. So that was cool. Um, I won't lie, after Friday and qualifying 17th and knowing our, you know we had gone the wrong direction in our car, but even then I felt like, I was possibly the worst race car driver in the world. Um, and then, you know, re- it's funny how one day can redeem yourself and passed a lot of cars, <laughs> made great changes to the car, and we flew through the field. And so was there, you know, the speedy dry gave me the lead from fourth place where everyone kept going off in the speedy dry that was still there from the, the track being oiled down and the track maybe had some oil on it. And then it took away the lead as fast as it gave it to me. So <laughs> it giveth and taketh in this PD try. So uh, two quick notes on that. Uh, number one, my wife has always my, been my rock through my career that has helped remind me that some of my best races uh, come after horrible practice or qualifying days. And mm. um, yeah, I don't know. Obviously, there's been plenty of bad race weekends that have gone after horrible <laughs> practice and qualifying days where you just had a crappy weekend altogether. But sometimes there's there's something to, you know, going to a track and having a bad Friday and qualifying like crap and, you know, kind of being frustrated with it and really digging in. And I, I actually, you know, you and I spoke on the phone Friday and 
Um, not that I had any impact in the setup of your car, but like we, you know, kind of jammed it out on the phone of just like where your head was at and what, you know, how confident you were and what you knew was wrong with the balance and where you wanted it to be. And it sounded like you and your team were already heading the right direction on a plan. And it's, and obviously it, it worked out. Um, you almost wanted things. So it's funny. <laughs> my wife is always the one that what I'd talk to on Friday nights or Saturday mornings. And she'd be like, well, you know, sometimes she, she wouldn't always know why, what went wrong or what my plan was. But she'd always <laughs> be like, you know, some of your best races come after you qualify or have a really bad practice day. Uh, the Her- other thing, the other point I wanted <laughs> to make is um, that's just a, another example of the emotional strain and volatility of this sport and how you are <laughs> only as good as your last race your last session your last <laughs> session your last lap you know yeah uh, because you on friday i know you were feeling like the the smallest person in wisconsin um, <laughs> or maybe even all of nascar and on saturday you couldn't have felt better about yourself and yet here we are it's a new week and um Back whatever zero. comes this week <laughs> pretty much doesn't matter nothing matters nothing that happens last week matters anymore once you hit the track uh this weekend no it doesn't uh we've and i your wife is so right about that and it's some sort of inverse prop- property there but she would have a great time with my dad who likes to come up to me whenever i qualify up front and he goes i wish you qualified further back <laughs> Like, why he's like i don't like the pressure of being a friend. i'm like dad he's not a, he's not a sports guy so it's not his thing <laughs> um some reviews uh producer josh was able to give us some of these so i'll read through some of these uh from crazy Apple his Podcasts. first name is producer and his last name is josh yeah. producer josh love that finally finally a podcast that covers topics across multiple motorsports disciplines keep it up that's from d mark d marp k uh that's an interesting one great racing <laughs> podcast you always get great info and insight from two of the smartest drivers in nascar the tone reminds me of positive regression uh the david smith's old podcast but the excitement reminds me of dirty mode dough uh that's steve charts podcast when the episode props up i immediately stop what i'm listening to and start this one keep up the good work thanks captain ron 1616 and then worth it good podcast for someone who just likes to listen to people talk about racing, good people at that. Parker and Landon are great guys, and I've been rooting for these guys for a while, having learned how cool they are through their sim racing involvement. That's Mylar High Life. Nice. nice. Love that. Miller High Life. Um, I'm going with Miller High Life on that one. Yeah, I like Miller High Life. Speaking of sim, ra- sim racing, we completed our big, huge event, the biggest sim racing event in America, the Firecracker 400 last week. Logan Helton, our champion in an epic battle down to the last – to the uh, start finish line, but what o- overall great event by Thrustmaster uh, presented by Thrustmaster this past month. Uh, we're all very tired, so we can keep this short from talking about Firecracker. <laughs> but it was cool. Uh, we had a great champion, and it was cool to see the event after a year hiatus uh, have such a great following and viewership and everything. Yeah, I mean it was it was awesome. It was a good race too. Um, you know, first pretty much more than half of the race went. Um, caution free so we got to see two full cycles of green flag pit stops almost a third cycle of green flags pit stops which is really cool to see in a sim race uh, kind of normal to see in an ascar uh, real life race but in a sim race it's it's a bit of a treat and um just overall good racing good community vibes um great energy kind of really motivated us to to bring it back again and make it even bigger and better for for the sim racing world and did we mention that there was 122 122- uh, laps that went green flag from the start. <laughs> That's what I said. Yeah, it was the oh, first two. Yeah. The, yeah, first two cycles green. I mean, basically on Monday of the race week, we have the Firecracker 200, which is a 200 mile race um, at Daytona, and that is for the half of the field through second round that did not qualify for the Firecracker 400. And that was a great race in itself. But we pretty much went green flag that distance. In the, to start the Firecracker 400, which was pretty incredible. Wow. It's, it was crazy to see the tone of the drivers, you know, and, and how serious they were about keeping their cars together in one piece, their virtual cars together in one piece. And um, it's, a, it's a very serious race. And so, very. Uh, my my eight-year-old Beckham was, uh, son Beckham, he was so motivated after it that he told me he wanted to win the Firecracker 400 next year. <laughs> 
Yeah. I love that. So he's, that's he's amazing. Gotta get started it's on making that. race he's car drivers practice. <laughs> get some practice going. <laughs> he'll be nine, so you know maybe yeah. he'll. Well, we won't talk about the age cutoff of, of thirteen, but yep. you know. <laughs> um, all right. So before we move on from the PR lap, I just want to make my first big bold statement <laughs> of this podcast episode. And okay. I'm going to have another one later. And you're, you're all going to have to listen for the second one, and it'll be later in this episode. Uh, but the first one is AJ Allmendinger put in one of the greatest qualifying laps in NASCAR history this past weekend at Road America for the poll that very few people will talk about or remember. Uh, basically the opposite of my performance on Friday. And <laughs> <laughs> I say this because I'm not going to get too deep into setup and all that stuff because I, obviously I know a lot. Uh, being that we work closely with colleague, but what I will tell you is that that car had no business turning the lap that it did. And if you watch that lap, the pole lap he does early in the session, it is that car is moving around on a repave in a way that not a single other car that you watch uh, in that qualifying session moves around. And he is just sheer willing it to go as fast as it does. And if you watch through the kink, which was unbelievably treacherous on that Friday um, during the repave. There was zero grip. People were wrecking all over the place. It was so hard to go through there. He has like a couple mile per hour through there on anyone. And it, the car is wiggling around and moving and falling over. And I just I, – I, in our debrief, he wasn't there. But in our debrief uh, yesterday, I said I believe that might be one of the best qualifying laps ever. And <laughs> because it was the Xfinity Series – you know, and it's a standalone. Not a lot of people have seen it and not the date on it. But if you want to go back and watch that, it is one of the greatest qualifying laps in the history of NASCAR. Something about um, AJ and Road America in those cars. And he just knows how to squeeze every ounce of it. You know, that I get, I get yep. what you're saying there to say that they kind of missed the setup. And it was indicative in the race, obviously. Um, but to just... <laughs> Baja the thing to the pole. <laughs> Do qualifying laps, uh, you know, I actually just saw on Twitter this morning a uh, Zane Smith's car from uh, what win did he have recently? Now I, now I can't even, I'm trying to tell a story and I can't remember the, the track, but he, they made a, um, a race win die cast of his that like had all the tire marks and the quarter panels are basically completely smoked out from where his truck, mm. truck caught on fire. Do they oh, make Coda? Coda. Coda, there you go. Okay. Do they make, um, qualifying pole run die cast to commemorate or is that something is that a special request that you need to put in parker to i think that'd have to be a special request <laughs> <laughs> well if they did then look no further than spoilerdiecast.com as a young company growing in the racing world they're shaking up the industry with your unique offerings maybe pole winning die cast who knows from nascar to dirt sprint cars indycar and f1 spoilerdiecast.com has one of the largest inventories in the game with over 800 unique products in stock and the best part all orders ship same or next day with free shipping on orders over $20. Plus, their pre-order system lets you secure your diecast with a $0 down option. Hey, I said that right this time. And <laughs> as a special offer for our listeners, use promo code MONEYLAP at checkout for free shipping and a whopping $5, $5, 5% off your order. That's right, 5% may not sound like much, but it's the most aggressive offer in the racing world. Don't miss out on this deal from SpoilerDieCast.com. Parker, I almost Bam. read it perfect. You were so close, but it's so great. Close. Check out spoilerdiecast.com for all your <laughs> diecast needs. Maybe they'll have an AJ Omni or a pole winning car one of these days. Um, or hopefully a Park Klingman win car. That would be great. I'd love that. It would be cool well, to, have custom, uh, to have special diecast to commemorate all of the onboards of the day that we do in the Money Lab newsletter. Because that is the <laughs> coolest part of the Money Lab newsletter. Make sure you subs subscribe to that and get our... Uh, three times a week newsletter, but we include the, the onboard of the day. And I don't know where you guys always source these things. Cause I have not provided a single onboard of the day to the group, <laughs> but there's some of the sickest laps I've seen. Like one Pablo Montoya in his heyday. I mean, some, Oh yeah. Um, Alonzo, like incredible onboards of some incredible drives. They're money laps, money laps, baby. Pretty cool. So, Let's move into some of the biggest news from around the world and just topics from the racing world this past weekend. Formula One raced at uh, Spa Frankershop in Belgium, and Max Verstappen won. Surprise, surprise. We always like to do that. But he won by a massive, I think, over 22 seconds over his teammate Sergio Perez. Perez, sorry, Perez. I can't say names today. Um, and it, 
a lot of people were on this. You know, I saw Helmet Marco had some comments like, this is the best Perez can do. He doesn't have another gear. Maybe this will, like, light a fire in him to find some more speed. But they have to remember, and we don't have to go too deep in this, but this car is never going to be tailored for whatever Sergio needs. Like, that's just not going to be the case. It's going to be a Max Verstappen car that you happen to drive and you just be as close as you want. And the last part about that that's so funny <clears throat> is he's second in points. He's won races. This is the perfect second teammate. People are like, oh, they're going to replace him, all this stuff. It's like, no, 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 no. You want someone who is a solid two to three tenths behind your number one guy when you have a dominant car because it makes it very easy. Number one guy is going to win a lot of races. He's going to win the championship. And your number two guy is going to keep you, you know, he's going to pick up the slack when the number one guy, for whatever reason, doesn't win. And he's going to ensure that you win the Constructors' Championship by a massive margin. You can lock it up early. Game over, right? That's the perfect scenario. Your strategy is easy. It's always the number one guy comes first. And therefore, it's like, who cares? This is perfect. This is exactly what they wanted. My question to you is because we can go deep in that. Have you ever been in a position, and I'm thinking more from Sergio's perspective here, of like being outdone by a teammate at this level? Like, I don't know. I've been trying to think about it. And I'm like, what would be my thought process then? But I mm -hmm. think he's being compensated uh, accordingly, would be my guess. <laughs> I mean, I, yes. I, I mean, obviously, I feel like last year uh, there were many times where I was being out. You know, Daniel and I both felt like we were being outdone by AJ. And maybe even similar to F1 because, the, you know, the way that Colleg operated at the time then was the cars were all set up the same. And, I, you know, it felt like the cars were set up built around AJ's historical setups and a lot of times mm -hmm. were built for AJ. So I almost felt like that could be a comparison there. Um, you know, when Sergio, Sergio as his own race car driver himself wanting to win his own races for himself is probably thinking, you know, if they set the car up for him, then he would have a better opportunity to win. Or if he had the opportunity to develop the setup around his driving style, um, I, yep. You know, it's it's hard to say. You you talk about that, and you're more knowledgeable about F1 and how those that team dynamic works than I am. I don't know factually, <clears throat> you know, how Red Bull operates. Maybe it's impossible for any of us to know factually how Red Bull operates in terms of the team dynamic, how the car's designed and set up, who it's set up for, how much effort they actually put into Sergio's balance in his car for him. Um, but if if this if the car, you know, I. I I disagree with your original statements a little bit on Sergio being perfect second teammate or teammate and that he's doing great or anything because I, I do still feel like he's underperforming. Um, hmm. I feel like he should be within a tenth of max. A tenth I'm going to disagree with you. I, I think he should be within a tenth or two of max. Max has the field cleared... Uh, the, the field cleared by a half a second. Yep. Sergio needs to be be in between that. Now he has been last week, I suppose, and but like over the course of the last month or two, he hasn't. There, he hasn't been the second place driver in the F1 grid. In fact, if there was no Max Verstappen, Verstappen, it wouldn't be the Sergio Perez show. Yeah, and well, and that's seemingly in the same car set up for Max Max Verstappen. Obviously, I'm, I understand that, but it's in the same Red Bull car that has the field cleared by half a second. And you know, in my opinion, in my experience as a professional driver, if you're a professional racing driver, no matter how good you are, if you're driving a car that's designed and set up for another driver who is at the top of their game, you're just not gonna come within you know, a, one or two tenths of that driver in their own car. It's just, it's just very difficult because you have to perfect their own driving style essentially to do that. Yep. Um, so that's where I think that Sergio should be maybe a couple tenths off of Max. But, I mean, there's been times in the last month or two where he's been not just the full gap to the field off of max, but even more so when max is winning and he's running sixth or seventh. Yep. Uh, so I'm going to disagree with you. been a, a red bull one too. Well, and I get your point, but I think history would, 
would disagree. And I'm going to go back to Senna versus Prost. Far too closely aligned. McLaren almost has a perfect season, but they have this inner rivalry that is just destroying the race team. Let's fast forward past that into another era. Uh, I so can't you're saying the there needs to be a clear hierarchy. Like I think they're best hi- the best scenarios uh, are clear hierarchy. So let's go McLaren late nineties. McLaren late nineties and unapologetic hierarchy. Now that's an yes, interesting. But, but hold on, hold on. Here, let, hear me out. So you got McLaren mid nineties, Mika Hakkinen, David <clears throat> Coulthard. David Coulthard was most definitely second to Mika Hakkinen, and in a perfect fashion where it was obvious Mika was the number one. David was serviceable. He was close enough, but to his own admission, I just recently saw, you know, he, he was a good race car driver, not a great race car driver. Mika was another level. Mika was able to challenge Michael Schumacher at the highest level. David Coulthard was not. That allowed McLaren to win two championships that David would not have gotten them. And if he had a closer teammate, it could have made, had, they would have had to make decisions that maybe would have allowed Michael Schumacher and Ferrari to find it in to beat him for those championships. Now go past that to the Michael Schumacher, Rubens Barrichello era. Great example. Rubens Barrichello, clear-cut second place. Michael Schumacher, clearly number one. They go on an absolute tear with five championships basically in a row, right? Then you, you, know, you go past that uh, era to the Mercedes, or you have Vettel and Mark Webber, uh, which was a little too close for a while, and then eventually Vettel became a clear-cut number one. That allowed them to win in multiple championships. And then you go to the Hamilton-Rosberg era. They were too close. When Rosberg was able to put everything he had into that year in 2016 to win the championship, which you know he basically said, I had to go almost too far, and that's why he quit afterwards, he was able to beat Hamilton. That's too close. That put them in multiple positions where they had to make really tough choices and bad decisions That because the drivers were too close with a car that should have easily won the championship. I think Valtteri Bottas and Hamilton was a great example of a clear second and a clear leader. That allowed them to win championships. You need to have that separation, and if it gets too close, it becomes too much of a of a trying to dis, like a dis, internal decision process that allows your competition to find cracks in your armor to go out there you're, and beat you. You're right. You're right. You're right. I, I wasn't thinking of it from the perspective of like what's actually the goal here. Yep. And it doesn't work. And I but guess you want it's them unusual. to be close enough. They can't. They can't be off in left <clears throat> field because that kills well, you. They, the yeah, they still have to be productive. Yeah. Um, but I guess it's it's unusual to think of it. It's just not in our NASCAR culture to be like. No. To eat. well, I think it might be entwined in the culture in there somewhere to say at some organizations to say this is the car we wink wink care about <laughs> but um but we're a multi-car wink wink organization and we wink wink want all of our cars to win but you know what i mean i think that that's i but it's just like it's not in our culture to admit that that there is a lead car that we are intent that this it's our intention to pour everything yeah. into that lead car and that it's the intention for the number two car to support the number one car you just don't see that very often you actually yep. more likely see it at smaller teams, right? Where, um, where there is a funded car that gets all the good stuff, and then an unfunded supporting teammate car that you know more or less shoot in some scenarios at the smallest levels. That was the car that paid for all the sticker tires for the funded team, right? They had to run the scuff yep. tires and they had to do all this stuff, and the prize money that they won is what paid for the sticker tires on the the funded <laughs> car. So, um. I think it's just unusual to think of it from that perspective, but you're right. I mean, that's like ingrained in the F1 culture that that is their strategy that, you know, I guess even though there's two car teams, there can only be one champion. Hell, um, it's just because it's the pit stop design. At the end of the day, it's also the, you know, they only have one pit yeah. for two cars. Yeah, they that's share your, pit road. Right, right there. That makes the decision for you right you there. Otherwise, choose. it'd be far more competitive. They've, they've talked at times about having two pairs of pit crews to try and make it more competitive. And I actually Can think that imagine? would be a very interesting thing. It, could you ima- like I'm imagining Hendrick Motorsports, and they have I've... four cars, <laughs> right? They have four yep. cars in yep. their organization, but they have two shops. And each car, you know, two of the cars run out of one shop, and two of the cars run out of the other shop. And then you know the manufacturing facility kind of feeds the the inventory at those those shops. Like, could you imagine that each individual shop had their lead car and the supporting car? Like that was just a square part of their intention. 
Mm-hmm. And maybe the the question is, would they be more successful? Like, would it? <laughs> would they actually be more successful if? If I don't even want to name drivers, right? Like I want to put anybody on the spot, to, but just to say one guy out of that shop is the lead driver, and the other one is the supporting driver, and your job is to run second to that guy, and then and then same goes for the other shop. Split it two car teams, two and there two. Would be, <laughs> there would be uh, there would be a riot. <laughs> would there would? I'm just saying that like over time, if the or, if the, imagine if the whole organization bought into that, and and you yeah. know the manufacturer would have to buy into that too, right? Like you have a manufacturer that's backing that organization with a lot of yep. money, um, yep. would have to say, okay, yeah, we're willing to say, but would the end result be better? Would would they end up winning a championship more, winning more races, more championships, and would that supporting car end up running better too? Would they run top five more often? If the if hmm. the lead cars are winning, <laughs> it I can't answer it, but it is an interesting question to pose to them. Um, Would it hold the drivers to... more accountable to say you're a lead guy, you're expected to win, your teammate is yeah. expected to support you, you're expected to be the leader. I don't like, think what... our sport. I don't think NASCAR is designed for you, you because you just don't have to have the make. You don't have to make those choices. You can right. provide ample opportunity to four cars to every because car, of the yeah. way it's designed yeah and it's probably in your best interest right because and we have a rule that says that you have to yeah you have to you have a hundred percent rule <laughs> uh i personally just in terms of the teammate thing i don't know if in my i can't I, I haven't had a lot of opportunities in my career actually to have teammates which is a weird thing to say but i really haven't i've driven for a lot of single car teams uh when i think about it and you know been my own just on my own island um, and I can't, you know, this year, I think the closest I could say, like, hey, I have teammates that are beating me really badly would be, you know, Austin mm-hmm. Hill and Kale combined for, what, seven wins, and they're running basically the same cars. So I think that's an example. Uh, although it's not really apples to apples because they come out of different, obviously, different buildings and different organizations. Um, you know, I just, that's the closest I could think. And it's been interesting for me to sort of have to, look at it less as a like a negative and more as an opportunity to be like hey what okay what can i learn from those guys like what are they doing you know that sort of thing and that's where i've had to flip it but it's definitely interesting i think um although i you know i just haven't had that direct comparison so let's move on uh toto wolf had an interesting uh quote out there about the engine situation in Mm -hmm. formula one in terms of if f1 is making moves to equalize engines he said that's fine because they have a whole 3% rule where if a manufacturer gets more than 3% off, they can have like a special provision to allow them to make updates, which I believe is happening with Renault right now. Um, but he said if it ends up in a BOP approach, which is the old balance of performance for you IMSA fans out there and from the WEC world, he said that would be a catastrophe. Basically what he's saying is if we start to just equalize for the sake of equalizing week in and week out in a BOP fashion – uh, that would be a horrible thing for Formula One. I don't disagree with him. That makes then it, you know I struggle with BOP as a as a thing when you're supposed to be a technology based series, yeah. Where you know you're restricting artificially at different times because of a outward you know outsized performance. I, I just think that's an odd yep. thing for no, those I series. I agree. Um, I don't. I'm not a big fan of BOP, but I also you know those things all serve a purpose depending on what what the goal is and maybe you'll you know you're gonna hear oh my gosh i'm i watched this video now and it's playing Uh oh what did you do i was reading that article and it started playing a video and now you can hear it sorry about that <laughs> uh, um he's doing his research ahead of time guys <laughs> <laughs> well i'm just scrolling through our our show notes here and that article um that article was up so uh, where was I? No, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of BOP, but I also, you know, want to acknowledge that that different racing series have different goals, and maybe that that might be a re- reoccurring theme on this show and uh, other shows to come that you're going to hear me ask, like, what's the goal here? What are we trying to accomplish? And I feel like F part of F1's identity, you know, is the that they're trying to, that their goal is to push the limits of what a race car is capable of, and and give a platform for. Um, F1, you know, manufacture auto manufacturers to use F1 as a platform to to showcase their engineering prowess, right, and manufacturing yep. prowess. So, I think that BOP is is not 
you know, in that, in that guiding light. Um, I would even go as far to say that if F1 goes, con- continues down this path or, or even throttles up down this path of where the rest of mo- global motorsport is going, and we've talked about, you know, several times on this podcast of spec parts and, you know, controlling costs, quote unquote, and controlling parts and things like that. Um, that could be a little bit of a deter from their, or, or maybe a deviation from their guiding light of, um, of being a engineering, you know, performance based sport where yep. if the cars are just meant to be the same, does F1 risk losing its identity as F1? It's, I th- I think you hit the nail on the head, and I think that's exactly what he's basically saying. So we'll see where that goes, but I do believe I agree with him, and I'm in agreement with you. Uh, it's not right for Formula One, that style. Speaking of team bosses in Formula One, Otmar Schnaffauer has been removed at Alpine, <laughs> and I thought this was fun. We don't have to spend too much time on it, but I had a tweet where I was like, this is unusual because it usually takes about four to five driver changes and at least three to four technical directors before a team <laughs> principal takes the fall. <laughs> yeah. So we, He'll end up somewhere because team principals, I mean, once a team principal, always, always a team, team principal. principal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They'll just end up, you know, it, it's like a failing upwards thing. They'll just end up, he'll be, in, he won't be a team principal, but they'll be, he'll be like the CEO of a, of a race team or something like that. Or they'll be like, he'll just, next thing you know, he'll be the chairman. He'll be a board member at Mercedes or he'll be yeah, like, yeah. Well, like failing upwards. So Wait, like, whatever whatever principal? the title is, it doesn't matter. He'll just he'll still have a Prevost bust at the racetrack and fly home on a jet with the team owner. Like that's pretty much what happened. <laughs> We're not talking for experience, we swear. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, not I that we've think, ever seen anything like this before. Not like that, yeah, we've never seen anything like that. Um I do think it is a signal to the Formula One crowd and your higher ups in Formula One that hey the money is pretty big right now. The eyes on the sport are pretty yeah. intense. You're going to be under more scrutiny. Make it happen quicker. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, no longer is it five, six years sit there on your throne and and just move a bunch of chess pieces around until mm-hmm. they finally figure it out that you don't know what you're doing. It's like, hey, figure it out now or get out. It, here, here's the <laughs> here's the driver's advice to F1 team principals: If you don't want to deal with the job position. Uh, insecurity or volatility of your job, you want to continue being a team principal, um, don't put that microphone on when the Netflix people come by you with a camera. Uh, <laughs> don't suit up. Just off that, you know, uh, push that duty off to one of your other admins. Let them be the star of the show. Um, you keep running the team and taking calls from the owner. And as long as yep. you can stay under the radar, you'll, your job security will be intact. But you know, I don't know. These team principals are the stars of the show. They're, they're, you're seeing articles written about them constantly. They're featured in magazines and fashion shows uh, mm. with, uh, with great, what is it, great whatever comes Attention. great responsibility. Yeah. Yep. It seems like almost like they're being treated sort of like drivers, which would then mean you would be <laughs> under far more scrutiny far quicker. Huh. See how that works. I don't. I still don't think that'll. I don't. I don't think the job will be as volatile as a driver's job. I think that. No, it's um, too. I think they're still pretty well insulated. But it is an interesting. Yeah. It is an interesting theory to follow that you know that maybe the the extra attention on the sport and the the media attention and the you know the glamour around it um, is is going to put them a little bit more on the hot seat um, when it comes to teams yep. wanting to make moves. I also last thing I'll say on this. I did see a quote, and I don't know how legit it was so just take this as a great assault but it made me laugh on twitter it was like uh you know people were it, it was tears flowing at alpine as he left but it was it wasn't otmar that was crying he said there was other people crying around him <laughs> it's like what a quote people were crying for me as i left <laughs> <laughs> of course that's what happens to the start of the show in nascar no. moving on uh richmond was a race that happened um <laughs> yeah so it was a race i don't know what else to say I, i'm not i mean i'm not here to flame the race um i don't 
I'm as a as a genuine racing fan of all types of racing. Like I can find interest in a lot of different races, and I was. I mean, I wouldn't say I was like captivated by the race by any means, but um, it did have its nuances. You know, the Toyotas looked strong at the beginning, and you know, uh, the RFK cars found their legs the second half and put themselves in position and threw some green flag cycles and um you know you want to say strategy not i mean it's just the strategy around the the green flag cycles and their adjustments and keeping up with the racetrack um i was content with what i saw with 20 laps to go um didn't have to see a caution to make it exciting by that point the race wasn't you know wasn't going to change the world right no in fact i would have been probably more disappointed anyways if busher hadn't won at that point because it's almost like by 10 laps to go it was like okay busher won this race he should win this race if there's a caution and somebody other than busher wins this race it's more they just stole the win and who's really going to be impressed with that yep um so i don't know i mean richmond is really funny because it's such a legendary racetrack and it's such a track that i love but for some reason this version of richmond right now and the way that this pavement is aging, it has great tire wear, which we love as drivers. But it it lacks, and this is really unique, it, la- it mm-hmm. just lacks character. Because, yep. you know, Atlanta had incredible tire wear. And, and Darlington has incredible tire wear. But they, what comes with that tire wear, which I think is what we really want as drivers, more so than just the tire wear itself, is character the bumps the the you know the patches the weird grip patches and and the way that the paint responds you know the dashed lines or or the you know the yellow line on the the apron or the dashed lines through the track like sometimes the cars respond over those dashed lines or or the seams at fontana they all have these little nuances that make a huge impact not just lap to lap but weather changes and tire changes and in traffic and stuff and and that's character and for some reason richmond is like is just this version of richmond right now is just lacking that character the paint doesn't really do much it does you know kind of in three and four you can use your right sides on the dashes and and generate a little bit of momentum off the corner um but man i mean you move your your groove around from bottom to top and your lap time doesn't change hardly it's just almost like a which one would you rather run, the bottom or the top? You're going to run the same speed anyways. You know, Maybe it's just if you're faster than the guy in front of you, you just run the opposite line that he's running and until you get to the point where you can I'm, pass him. I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you. Go ahead. I'm going to stop you right here. I, need a, I have to ask a question. Hmm. Tell me what is the last race you can remember that was truly a rare – like rare enterta- – had, had the entertainment value. Not we as racers find the entertainment. Had like the in-your-face entertainment value at Richmond. Um, I mean I'm, I'm not saying this is the last race, but obviously there's that famous moment where Kyle Busch and Dale Jr. wrecked in 2008. Yeah, that's uh, 2008. That's yeah. the one that's okay. So I've been asking this question since I've been Long going on the broadcast side. So I've been asking the same question. I said, "When's the last time you saw a good race here?" This I started doing this probably back in 2017. We are still unable to come up with anything else than that 2008 <laughs> time, <laughs> and then the spring race that year where they were running up next to the wall. Since then, there has not been one memorable big race from like anyone can be like, "That's the one." Like there just isn't. There isn't. Yeah, I, I believe the track is, this place. To me, the track isn't just is just not changing enough. I, I'm sorry it's to get. I, I guess I'm I'm trying to get in the weeds on it and getting technical and and I do you know we can keep moving with this, but um, but to me it's just like the track's just not changing enough. It doesn't it doesn't no nope. you know the lanes don't change, the tires don't react a lot. They just you know you the, no the groove only, is becoming better. The, than the only other saving grace that is. we keep. That keeps us going back to Richmond with optim- optimism as drivers is like there's two and a half seconds of fall off, right? And yep. so we think that that's going to produce like, well, at least there's tire fall off. We're going to go back there and maybe this time we're going to see. But it's like it's tire fall off, which is great, but there's no volatility. There's no yep. like, 
you burned your tires up and so you just go backwards or the, you know it just and you can save them and you can ex, you know accelerate the end of the run it's just like everybody sees the same tire fall off from lap 1 to lap 50 or 100 of a green flag run they see it over the cor- the same pretty reasonable rate of fall off over the course of 100 laps and so it just doesn't like there's just no no variability there it's almost like the thing that makes racing exciting is when there's all this volatility and variability in the track or unpredictability. That's why we love bumpy racetracks. That's why we love dirt racing, right? Because yep. the dirt track changes lap to lap. You just, it's almost impossible to engineer a dirt track because well, it's, it's hard to predict. <laughs> um, that's so Dale jr. Had a thing, a, a tweet about it. And I just quote tweeted and said, dirt question mark, like just cover the damn thing in dirt. <laughs> I don't care. Like, it can't be worse. It can't be worse it than we need have to, to watch dirt. right now. It just needs... But here, it, no, here's my problem. Here's the thing. It's slow when you're in person. The cars look incredibly slow. Incredibly mm-hmm. slow. They're not moving around a ton because the preferred groove is right on the yellow line. Or right on the line. You know, you move... Sometimes you make speed up top, but eventually you just got to get back to the bottom. So there's nothing yep. there. The cars aren't going fast. And the worst part is it's in a cool city. It's very close to the downtown of that city. And yet... I can't believe how many people actually show up. Like, that's how bad it is. So I just – I personally think they need to do literally anything, anything. Seal it, pave it, reconfigure it, put dirt on it. I don't know, but I'm just going to say I enjoyed driving it as a driver. I enjoyed it this year. I had a lot of fun in the Xfinity race, passing cars and saving my tires. But from a fan perspective and from a broadcast perspective, do literally anything. Uh, huh. I do want to say one other thing. Um, RFK. That was pretty cool. See how fast they were. And I know that Toyota started off strong in the 2311 cars, especially the 45 and the 23, but then you had RFK with Brad and then eventually Chris Buescher, uh, who takes the win. But that, that was cool. And I think, uh, it's just cool. I, I, I like to see in this next gen era, I just like seeing teams like that hit it and be on it, you know? And, and mm-hmm. it's just like, oh, that's the, that's the parody and the, the cool part of what's happening right now in the sport. And it's a great example seeing RFK. Yeah. And I think Brad Keselowski uh, may get that first RFK win here soon. If they can keep, obviously if they can keep showing up with speed like that. Definitely. I th- I'm seeing some of your next couple topics that I'm kind of anxious to get into. Let's. Uh... All right. So the up down splitter was being tested yesterday, being Monday, July 31st. And then today, August 1st, uh, this is the idea behind basically creating a new front splitter on these cars that has air packing underneath it. And then when you would get behind another car, that air would then remove itself and you would create more downforce. So it's basically tighter without car in front and more downforce. Some early feedback I got from uh, a cup driver who remained nameless, uh, who is not there, but at least obviously is getting feedback said um, basically they should put a plow on the front and rip the place up. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's a tough – it's going to be a really tough place for that thing to show off as a pair, compared to, like, New Hampshire. Um, but, yeah, I mean, interesting concept. I saw the early feedback wasn't maybe, like, they got what they hoped, but there's a lot of data that they'll dig through. Yeah, yeah. So <sighs> we'll see. Um, I don't know if you've gotten any other feedback. Not entirely. I talked to a cup driver yesterday um, and got saw some some other feedback from a cup driver that was a little bit just complaining about the way the car drove, which to me is like I don't really well, care of about. Of course, it's gonna why. suck. Yeah, of course, <laughs> it's gonna suck. Like I think it's just uh, let's not lose sight of the goal, or maybe we don't even know what the goal is. Um, you know, it's it's a test, right? And you're not gonna know everything or learn everything right off the bat. Um, so. I did. We'll the, I think it. the most productive thing that I noticed out of the quotes and out of things yesterday is that William Byron told Bob Prockers that he was loose in traffic. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Which, which to me makes sense, or, or that was like the first sign of like, hey, this thing is actually working or actually doing something, because um, as we know, the the, the splitter is supposed to generate a hundred pounds more downforce than it generate in dirty air, than it generates in clean air. And that would presumably go to the front, I suppose, um, is what they've said. So um, I'm not saying that he needs – I'm not saying that's what we want. We don't, we're not trying to make cars loose in traffic. But yep. um, but if it's but responding like that – But that's a better change like than that, tight. 
Right. <laughs> if it's responding like that, then maybe that means um, they can they can tune around it and make it, um, you know, effective. So yep. definitely interesting. I think they have some tire stuff they're working on today. I think uh, so. Some softer tires. That, so. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll keep up with that. We'll get some more information. Um, I did have an interesting conversation this weekend <clears throat> with I can't I will not name names here, but it's an Xfinity Series driver who was talking about how they've been offered a cup ride. And they said, you know, I've, I'm looking at this thing and I'm not really going to make any more money if maybe just a little bit more, but I'm giving up my Sundays. I'm going for 38 weeks and I probably have a very small chance of winning races like I do now or winning a race. And I, you know, and I shouldn't say races because this driver, uh, and I'm going to mix this up. This driver has one. Let me say it's the best way. Um, so they can't figure out who it is. And uh, and does this does this driver control the sponsorship? Like, is the sponsorship yes. the real reason that the teams want him? Whether yes. it's Xfinity yes. or Cup? Yes, exactly. But their point was really interesting. And I sat there and I was like, "Wow, I've you know that's a pretty fascinating thing." Because forever it's get to the top, get to the top, get to the top. And then another driver was there and was like, "Man, I don't disagree. Like, I." don't know why I want to go there. <laughs> I was like, I've heard this over the last couple of years and I do find it fascinating yeah. that you have this, you know, for, you know, if you go back 15, 20 years, the difference of what you would be paid would be big 10 X. Right. And so it just justified it immediately. But if it's yeah. not massively different, you're signing up for a huge amount of frustration, pressure, more time spent on the road for what yeah. game? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so here it is then. Yep. This is, we've been talking about F1 top signals and things like that. To me, that is your NASCAR driver bottom signal. The bottom is in on NASCAR mm. drivers. Mm. The, it's as low as it gets. <laughs> it's as low as it gets. We've, we've, the last few years, almost the last decade, you could even say, drivers have been losing leverage, losing leverage, cutting salaries, cutting salaries contracts have gotten shorter more demands on drivers to bring sponsorship can't can't go anywhere without a sponsor T first thing the teams ask you is if you have a sponsor they don't even care how good you yep. are they don't even evaluate you as a driver almost they just want to know if you got money um yep. and 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 i'm gonna i'm gonna tie this with another comment from richmond that i wanted to expand on earlier but we, we're moving on now i can tie this back um <laughs> You know, because I was watching the race at Richmond, and I texted you, and I was like, "Man, this race, this field is so competitive." Like, look at Chris Busher leading. You know, for RFK, both RFK K cars are in the top five. Ross Chastain and Daniel Suarez are back here running twenty eighth and 29th. <laughs> yep. Like, these yep. these are cars with wins. You know, organizations with wins, and the whole field sprinkled everything in between. We got, we're, we're talking about Michael McDowell. You know, in the playoffs right now. Um, just the field is just deep right now. R race winning teams straight up running outside the top 25 on an oval is not usual for NASCAR. You yep. know, that just tells you how competitive the NASCAR cup series field is. And I think my point is how important the driver is going to be moving forward. If the cars are this equal, they're going to have to invest in drivers. Yep. And they're gonna have to lock up the good ones, and mm. and at the same time, you're looking at a Cup Series field that's extremely competitive, where the driver is important. And oh, and by the way, my other point is you have a place like RCR where Kyle Busch is driving circles around his teammate, yep. right? Hopped in the same yep. hopped in the same car, driving circles around his teammate. So, yep. you know, Kyle Busch is obviously the difference maker there in the eight car. So driver value in the Cup Series right now is couldn't be more important. And then, but we've we've been beat to death with this market over the last ten years of the driver being devalued. Yep. Right, and salaries getting cut, and and all everything that I said leading into this, to the point where my bottom signal is you just recanting this conversation with an Xfinity driver that's that by the way because the market forced them to they control yep. their sponsorship yep 
right? So they basically control their own destiny because the market forced, these team owners have forced that driver and every other driver, but has forced that driver to come up with their own funding. Yep. So that driver controls where they go because of their sponsorship. And now that that driver has everything they need to run their business, has their sponsorship, is in a car that they want to be in, is sitting here going, I don't want to go cup racing. <laughs> There's Why no incentive. I? Why yeah. would I? The teams aren't willing to pay me enough yet. I bring the money. Yep. And I'm not getting an offer from a team that can win or that has a winning car or has one. And mm -hmm. I bring the money. I can stay where I'm at because my money can get me the job that I want in Xfinity where I can win. I'm not going yep. anywhere. That's so that, te that cup really team smart. is going to have to turn around and say, okay, driver, well, now you know the salary is going up or maybe the re sponsorship requirement goes down or maybe they give them a big cut of the sponsorship. Or maybe they prove mm. to them, you know, where they're going to make performance changes to get the team at a better place so that they can win. Maybe it's a team without a technical line, or, you know, whatever it is. I don't, I don't know any, you know, any details of this, of this transaction or who this driver or the team is. But like, the driver is obviously to me seems like in a leveraged position. Yep. Yeah. Definitely. That's super fascinating. You said that so well. I love that bottom signal. There you go. <laughs> for drivers, the driver market in the Cup Series <clears throat> bottom signal. Uh, just quick thing that happened uh, a couple days ago that Adam Stern put out there was that Supercars is actually going to sponsor Brody Kostecki in his NASCAR Cup Series debut, promoting their product Superview, uh, which is a streaming service, as they got 14,000 expressions of interest in the product following SVG's win at Chicago. So kind of cool. See a series sponsoring another driver in another series. Wow. I've, uh, I've owned Superview before. And it's awesome. I also do their YouTube subscription uh, as well sometimes. So I go in and out. I can't. I I get subscriptions. I cancel them. I go off and on. So don't don't uh, don't use me as a great <laughs> uh, <laughs> reference. Um, I think the last big thing we can get into here today would be Formula E as they just finished their season and Jake Dennis was able to get the championship in a dramatic finale in London that had crashes red flags all sorts of craziness and then they even had a crazy last race uh and a track that was pretty awesome where it went inside and then outside again because they just have some of the coolest track designs but mm -hmm. i sat there and i watched a lot of this and i watched the highlights uh for the money lap newsletter you can get on mondays and i'm gonna make my second big bold statement you want to hear it let's hear it all right my second big bold statement i tweeted this as well <laughs> Formula E is the best series in the world, motorsport series, that no one is talking about. And let me just give you a couple facts. First and foremost, there's an immense level of talent in this series full of pro drivers. When I say pro drivers, I know this because they're being paid, and they're being paid, from what I'm told, a lot of money. Maybe the most of any series in the world outside of potentially NASCAR Cup Series um, or even you know, outside Formula 1 in terms of how many people are being paid. It's unbelievable. Um, you have tons of manufacturers. Obviously, some are coming and going, but there is a lot of manufacturers. The broadcast is incredible in terms of their ability to have, you know, just all sorts of funny features and things that they do in terms of being able to make it more entertaining. They go to very cool locations. They've got interesting technology. The track designs are really well suited to their race cars. They kind of know what exactly makes their race cars tick, and so they design the track specifically for that. And it's very cool. So when I look at all that and I see all this and the presentation is amazing and the teams have great liveries and social media and I just sit there and I'm like, this is everything. Everything you want. There's only two things missing. Immense speed because they do go fast. We've talked about that. Mm -hmm. And then sound. But if you add – if those were internal combustion engines, what's different about this? What, what would make – like, why, why would you not pay attention to a series that has different winners, close championship finales, all these amazing things I just talked about? It, it has everything. It has everything. So the only thing is that it's electric, and I'm like, that's not a deterrent to me. Um, I really think it's a sitting giant right now in the motorsports world. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not going to disagree with you. I mean, we've watched it. We've seen how good the racing is. Um, I think it's just funny that in this world right now, there has to be a desire for good racing. 
you know, like we, there's good racing in NASCAR, and we've proven that that doesn't necessarily move the needle in terms of the sport's global popularity, whether there's a good race, <laughs> right? Or even yep. what constitutes a good race. Yeah. Um, Formula E has the best, some of the best racing in the world right now, and it's doing great. And I'm sure that, you know, they could internally show us some numbers that show that it is growing in popularity, but is that what makes it go viral? Right, mm-hmm. F one didn't go viral because of good racing. F one went viral because of the storyline and the the um, the cinematics of Drive to Survive. Yep, um, and it blew up in popularity uh, because of that. It didn't blow up because of good racing. And I don't even know if good racing would have kept the popularity. I think that the society just took in F one and is moving on from it. <laughs> you know, and there's going to be some, they'll, they'll end up with a net positive of American F1 fans. We've yep. talked about that, but yep. you know, it's, it's the, the, the people, the, the tourists, the F1 tourists, or motorsports tourists, whatever you want to call them, will move on and they'll move on to the next viral topic, which is fine. Yep. I mean, that's, that's the world we live. That's entertainment. You know, that's they'll just, be doing threads on. on, well, they'll be doing threads on the next AI sport. And right. uh, from the yeah. crypto AI, <laughs> crypto you know, AI, whatever, superconductors, <laughs> whatever the hot topic of the day is that they're just suddenly yep. experts in, uh, you know, they were the same ones that were submarine experts and, you know, world war experts. All that and stuff. So, oh, yeah, stuff. I don't, I, you know, it's, it's maybe that's a, and maybe that's okay. Maybe it's a, it's a slow, um, it's a 50 year project. Maybe Formula E is a um, motorsports to, to truly build a sporting um, a global sport that people care about. I mean, look at what you're up against if you're trying to be as big as, as I got NASCAR, a question for F1, NFL, yeah, you know, Premier League, Major League Baseball, well, NBA. The Wait, here's a question. <laughs> here's a question. Here's a question. Uh, if racing series were stocks, would you buy from the E stock? Probably, yeah, yeah. I would right now, 100. percent I just don't yeah. know how I'd lose. I don't. I just don't if, see. If unless, it was a thirty-year, if, if I was looking, in if I was buying position. it with thirty-year buy and hold money, um, yeah, I think 30. I would buy Formula E stock. Oh, I would. I'd say quicker than that. I'd say five to eight-year horizon. You probably. I don't know. You know, I don't. Five-year horizon. I wouldn't buy it. I think I would wait another year. I would. I would wait to let the F one tourists clear out. Mm. Um, if I was so they hit it the on bottom. Three to five-year time horizon. Interesting. There could be some lingering popularity from F one. That's true, and there is, but there is the EV thing going on where you're just going to continually have more EV cars. So, yeah, um, I, I think it's fascinating. I, I really think they are they're one of the more fascinating things. We're going to dive. So next week, uh, we're going to dive into another upstart racing series out there and give our thoughts on it. And I actually think I'm now realizing that series. We'll talk about that one, and we can also add another one to compare it to that's out there. And sort of decide where these two series stand, what makes them interesting, what maybe doesn't make them interesting to us, and get some people's feedback. So we're all about talking about racing series on here. Um, with that, just some last things to rip through here, Landon. Uh, X-Track, gearbox company, probably the largest motorsport gearbox company in the world, uh, provider of gearboxes in NASCAR Cup Series, Formula 1 in uh, sports cars, was bought by a PE firm, but this is actually the second PE firm to buy them. <laughs> so RIP, uh, our gearboxes quality? Who knows? I'm kidding by that, by the way. We'll see. <laughs> I, I don't know any particulars. I just saw this out there as a headline. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> so private equity ready- firms have great reputations when it comes to uh, buying <laughs> running quality things. products. <laughs> I w- well, I do wonder what, um, what their... I mean, I guess it, it would be interesting to dive into, you know, is this a manufacturing-focused private equity firm? I would hope so. Um, and how do <laughs> private equity firms typically do in the manufacturing world? Um, I, w- I could see the attraction um, to investing in a, in a firm like x if they have a lot of contracts like the NASCAR one that are exclusive and, you know, it looks like easy money. Yep. So uh, before – I don't want to go too deep on this. Uh, but I did see that Motorsport Network was a uh, sold a majority stake to a PE firm out of uh, New York City recently, yeah. in the last month. So I wonder if you know you talk about F one tourism and motorsport tourism. Uh, you know what? 
what is is if they're not a manufacturing P firm, was this a motorsport play? Is there an idea that motorsports is expanding? And I saw one of the quotes from the capital from the firm was that motorsports was expanding in the U.S. and globally. So hmm. uh, that's not the X-Track one. That was from the one that bought Motorsport Network. So pretty interesting or, to see people are investing. Or if you're um, – Or they're buying the top. <laughs> if your family office just invested in an in F1-related private equity <laughs> project, you should probably call them and let them know that the Money Lab told you that F1 is uh, is cooling <laughs> off in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> and that your time horizon on that return might be a little bit longer than if you would have invested that money three years ago. Perfect. Love it. Uh, that's it. Michigan hey, is up next. Sports. Yeah, hey, have, have have a great time. Happy to have you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Michigan is up next in NASCAR. And speaking of cooling off for F1, they are in their summer break. And I'm just going to say it, those bastards. How <laughs> dare they? I, we need a summer. We had that two-week break that one time for the Olympics, and it was one of the greatest things in NASCAR history. Would love to find a way for NASCAR to have a little summer break. That would be very cool. Awesome. And this is like right. a real – it's a legit break. Like they don't actually – they're month. not allowed to work on their cars, right? They can't even – know the factories have to shut down. Everything, Isn't that awesome? It's amazing. It's one of the greatest designs uh, and just shows you know they're very ahead of everyone in that sense cool. for work-life balance. Very millennial of them. Anyway, that's it for the Money Lap. Peace. Hey, before you go, please like and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Also, click the bell icon below to be alerted to our latest videos. We also request that you let us know every single thing that we did wrong in this video or prior ones in the comment section below. We might just go through and answer them or you'll make it to the next episode of the podcast or our next video. Also subscribe on your favorite listening platform to be able to listen to this podcast on the go and subscribe to our newsletter at themoneylap.com to get the best five minutes in motorsports delivered directly to your email inbox every Tuesday and Thursday. Thanks for watching. Hang on, my three-year-old is... Uh Uh-oh. You want a pouch? We got kids. I gotta shake this kid off of me. My wife is sick, so I'm like... Oh, no. Fortunately, I only have Arlo right now. Um... But shake he's, this uh, kid off me. Let me go. Definitely, let me go turn be, on a show for him. Go do that. So I can go distract him for an hour. That needs to be the beginning. I need to shake this kid off of me. <laughs>